Are you hungry for the Word of God? Or do you desire to go deeper in your relationship with God? Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls teaches verse by verse straight through the Bible on Sunday mornings at 10 a.m. We meet at the YMCA at 1164 Freiburg Avenue. More information is available online at ccfergusfalls.com. Calvary Chapel, Fergus Falls, simply teaching the Bible simply. Well, with that, let's turn in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 1. Exodus chapter 1. Title of our study is Growth and Persecution. Now, if you remember, before we took a little detour to the book of Daniel, we were looking at the book of Genesis. And the book of Genesis is called the Book of Beginnings. That's another name for it. It's all about the beginning, how things happened, how things came to be. Um, the book of Exodus, it's going to start out kind of continuing a little bit of that story. Um, but the book of Exodus is about deliverance. In fact, the first part of that word, ex, uh, talks about coming out from something, leaving something behind. And so the book of Exodus is about leaving behind bondage. It's about uh, this idea of deliverance. Now, if you um, had a large group of people in bondage, how would you go about bringing deliverance? Most people would think about a war, starting a war, right? Fighting for freedom. Um, and that's how our society tends to think. But when God wants to change history, he doesn't start with a battle. He starts with a baby. In fact, if you take a look at the book of Exodus, it opens with people in bondage and the birth of a baby called Moses. What's so fascinating Again, there's so much correlation between the Old and the New Testament. When you look at the New Testament, it opens with a people in bondage. And it also opens with the birth of a baby, Jesus. So you see, the book of Exodus is the symbol of redemption and deliverance in the Old Testament. And, and the cross is that symbol in the New Testament, the symbol of deliverance. To kind of give you a high-level overview of this book of Exodus... Uh, the first 18 chapters about redemption, and then the rest of the book, uh, chapters 19 through 40, are about relationship with God and others. So there's a lot in here for us to study and learn about. Uh, the book of Exodus was written by Moses about 1425 B.C., and again, as we'll see as we've studied through many books of the Bible, it all points us to Jesus Christ. And we'll see uh, there's a lot of imagery here. Uh, appointing us to this Messiah to come, this Redeemer to come. And uh, we'll see that it points us to Jesus Christ. So with that, let's take a look at the first seven verses here, and we'll see that the Israelites become numerous in the land. So Exodus chapter 1, picking up in verse 1. Now these are the names of the children of Israel who came to Egypt. Each man in his household came with Jacob. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All those who were descendants of Jacob were 70 persons, for Joseph was already in Egypt. And Joseph died, all his brothers and all that generation. But the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly multiplied and grew exceedingly mighty and the land was filled with them we'll pause there so we can kind of see how the beginning of the book of exodus is really a continuation of the end of the book of genesis we see again it's written by moses uh, and you know what's fascinating is the first five books are actually written by moses and those first five books are so foundational, they actually make up one-seventh of the entire Bible. So sometimes you hear people say, well, I, I don't know, I just can't read the Old Testament. Uh, we need to read it. It's, it's foundational. It's one-seventh of the whole Bible. So it's very important we understand, understand the foundation uh, of God's Word. And uh, I mean, we get the answers to our questions. Where did we come from? How did sin get into the world? Um, and, and those kind of things. So 
it's really foundational. We know it and understand it. So we see the names here mentioned of the sons of Jacob who came down with their families into Egypt. It says 70 souls or 70 persons for Joseph was already there with his two sons, uh, Ephraim and Manasseh. Now, if you recall, Joseph um, was sold into slavery. Uh, he had uh, dreams about uh, being kind of uh, in charge, if you will, and his father's favorite child and got this coat of, uh, of blessing of many colors or lawn sleeves, if you will, and, and that didn't go too well with his brothers. So they wanted to get rid of him and, and, and sold him to some midnight traders and uh, on his way, he was off to Egypt, and uh, there in Egypt, uh, began to uh, have God's blessing and favor upon him. Eventually, he ended up second command in the land of Egypt. Uh, there was a famine in the land. His brothers came to find food, and Joseph chose to forgive his brothers. And we saw this a very powerful story of forgiveness and the importance of choosing to forgive those that have harmed us, because if we don't, it really is harming us more than it's harming them. So we see that Joseph uh, let his brothers and their family stay in Egypt. He began to actually provide for them as well. Uh, they were in the land of Goshen, uh, this land uh, that was for the shepherds there in Egypt. And it says that uh, the children of Israel were fruitful and increased uh, abundantly. They multiplied exceedingly, so the land was filled with them. And that's probably actually a little bit of an understatement. Um, what this is saying is there was a population explosion. Um, the Jewish people began to expand so rapidly. Um, and uh, we're told, again, there were about 70 Hebrews when the book of Genesis ends, when we get to the beginning of the book of Exodus. Give you a little spoiler alert. They do make it out of Egypt. And about 300 years after the death of, of Joseph, um, they have over 600,000 men over the age of 21. So a lot of people. So when the exodus happens, it's probably a million to two million, maybe even more people uh, that are leaving uh, Egypt. What's interesting is math statisticians tell us that they were doubling their population about every 25 years. So that's a huge population explosion. What's also interesting is that's actually what's happening to the world's population today. About every 20 to 25 years, our population, our world is doubling. Um, and so it's very interesting. I thought that was kind of an interesting correlation um, that we see today. So they are out of the state of population explosion that we see today. Uh, they were multiplying, and uh, this is a good thing. But we see that the enemy doesn't think so, and that Pharaoh has a different plan on how to control this. And we see that next here in verse 8 through verse 14, that uh, Egypt begins to oppress the children of Israel. So let's take a look at that here in Exodus chapter 1, picking up in verse 8. Now there arose a new king over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. And he said to his people, look, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come. Let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. And it happened in the event of war that they also join our enemies and fight against us, and so go up out of the land. Therefore they set taskmasters over them to afflict them with their burdens. And they built for Pharaoh supply cities, Pithon and Ramses, but the more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. And they were in the dread of the children of Israel. So the Egyptians made the children of Israel serve with rigor. And they made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar and brick and in all manner of service in the field. All their service in which they made them serve was with rigor. We'll pause there. We see that the children of Israel, again, their population is exploding. Um, and we see that Pharaoh actually begins to be fearful of them leaving the land, that they are more numerous than, than the Egyptians now. And he thinks that, you know, if another war would take place, 
as it happened from the Hittites in the north that came and attacked, that the Hebrews could take advantage of that, that they would go fight with the enemies, leave the land. And Pharaoh doesn't want that, so he's beginning to think through, what can I do to control the situation? How do I control these people? And his plan is through affliction, to oppress them, to, to, to lay upon them heavy burdens, essentially to make their life hard and miserable. And it's a reminder that uh, as we study this book, we'll see that Pharaoh actually becomes a, a type of the, the enemy, a type of the devil. The devil wants to make our life hard and miserable. Uh, he wants it to make us uh, discouraged. Um, but it's interesting that even under these conditions, the children of Israel continue to multiply and grow. And I think probably one of the greatest weakening things that can happen to a nation is prosperity. Nations seem to become strong and grow with adversity. If you study history, you take a look at uh, the Roman Empire. It was at a time where there was great peace and prosperity. Uh, Rome was uh, the, the controller of the known world at that time. And yet they uh, faded away from hi the history books, not because of a war, but because of a collapse from within. They began to um, change their morals, and they began to uh, become divided as a people, and eventually they collapsed from within. And so I think that's very interesting that we're seeing a little bit of that happen in our world today. I think the same can be said true of the church. The early church history, the church was going through such severe persecution, times of suffering, um, by the Roman government. We looked at this a little bit last week in Acts chapter 2. Uh, but we saw the early church was growing by leaps and bounds. And uh, it reminds me of uh, a Christian writer, Tertullian, uh, one of the early church fathers. He said, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. So what the um, enemy means for evil, God can use for good. And we see this throughout church history that when there is affliction, when there is persecution, uh, it actually causes people to be more radical for Jesus Christ. It actually kind of separates the wheat from the chaff. It, it causes people to realize, look, am I going to pretend to kind of be a Christian or am I all in? Am I going to really follow this Jesus Christ? And, uh, and so we see uh, uh, what happens in Christian uh, history is that uh, Christianity began to be an accepted religion, almost to the point of a, a state religion. In fact, in some areas, it did become a state religion. And in those areas, the church became weak. The church became comfortable um, and became, sadly, too much like the world. In fact, we see when he gets the book of Revelation, the seven letters to the churches, Jesus begins to rebuke some of those churches because they've compromised. They're starting to look like the world around them. They've lost that, that zeal, that first love. Uh, they're not shining brightly for him as they should be. And so I think, sadly, the, the churches of America are in a similar state today. I, I feel very uh, concerned when I look at uh, the churches over in Asia and over in Africa and, and India, uh, South America, other places where uh, they're living their whole life for Jesus Christ. There's no, there's no hint of compromise in their life. And it just reminds me that in America, we've kind of come to a comfortable Christianity. If you've ever watched the uh, Veggie Tales, uh, they're kind of called uh, these kind of people, the pirates who don't do anything. They want to be Christians, but they don't necessarily want to help people. They want to be with the group, but they don't actually want to do anything, right? And uh, so uh, we want to make sure that we're, we're seeking the Lord. And I think today uh, we're all addicted to comfort. We're all addicted to quick fixes. Um, I don't think we necessarily know how to have those uncomfortable conversations about heaven and hell uh, with people. Um, and I think people are really no longer up to the challenge to share the gospel message, to live that radical life of following Jesus. And so uh, my hope is that we have that desire uh, to have those difficult conversations with family and with friends, to talk about the Lord, um, uh, to, to bring up the eternal things with them, uh, to make sure that we, we are 
living our life for Jesus, that when we're out and about, we can ask people how we can be praying for them and, and those sort of things um, and see what God does. One of my continued prayers to the Lord is that I don't want more, Lord, than I can hold in my hands. I don't want more than I can fit in my hands, meaning I don't want to be so prosperous that it begins to change my heart, begins to soften me, where I begin to look to those things that you've provided me with instead of looking to you. But I don't want too little in my hands to begin where I begin to complain and say, Lord, you haven't done anything. You haven't taken care of me. I want just enough that I can hold in my hands, just enough that I can continue to walk by faith and trust in you. It's actually a prayer that David had uh, as well. And I think it's a good prayer. Um, And so we see that prosperity has the tendency of softening people, where adversity has the tendency of doing the opposite. It's making people stronger in their faith in the Lord. And maybe you've experienced this. Maybe you've gone through a trial, and you never signed up for the trial. You never volunteered to go through the trial, but you went through this trial through the storm anyways. And what you found was that it it drew you closer to the Lord. And that's what happens when you face a trial. either makes you better or makes you bitter. You either become discouraged and you want nothing to do with the Lord and you push the Lord away and you turn your back on him or you realize, where else can I go but to God? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lean into him. I'm going to find my encouragement in him. I, he's going to be my source and my strength, my refuge. And you walk through this trial, through, through it with the Lord, through this valley of the shadow of death with the Lord. And on the other side, you realize you have a deeper faith, a deeper trust, a deeper relationship with the Lord. And that's what trials do, is they increase our faith, they increase our trust in the Lord. And so again, what the enemy means for evil, God can use for good. It also reminds me of the principle, Isaiah 54, 17. Uh, It says, no weapon formed against you shall prosper. You see, the enemy was trying to attack the Hebrews, uh, trying to destroy them. And God said, that will not prosper. Um, it reminds me the wrath of man can never stop God's plan of salvation. Um, and so God is, is working out his plan. No one can defeat God's plan for his people. Um, God is the one in control. And he's the one that's going to work out his sovereign plan. So we see that uh, the Egyptians uh, begin to persecute the children of Israel. Um, but we'll see in a moment that it's not enough, um, that it's actually backfiring on them, their plan, uh, that they're continuing to be stronger. And, um, and so we'll see in this, this uh, next section, verse 15 through verse 22, that the Hebrew wi- midwives get involved. And so we'll pick up here in uh, Exodus chapter 1, uh, verse 15. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shipra, and the name of the other was Pura. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew woman, and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, you shall kill him. But if it's a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children. So the king of Egypt called the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mightily. And so it was because the midwives feared God, that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded to all his people, saying, Every son who is born to you, you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. We'll pause there. We begin to see that Pharaoh, or the ruler of Egypt, sought to prevent this, the, the Hebrews, the children of Israel, from their population increasing. And uh, we see when that Uh, general order uh, didn't work out well, that he had another plan. We see a plan of affliction led to the plan of annihilation. Uh, And we see that he ordered these two midwives uh, to kill the baby boys. Uh, Actually, the moment that they would be born. 
Now, first, we shouldn't expect that these two midwives were the only midwives in the land. Perhaps that they were a leader among those who were midwives, those who cared for mothers and newborns at childbirth. Some have a problem here with the midwives when the Pharaoh said, how come you haven't fulfilled my order? And we see the reply is that these women are just so lively. Before we can get to them, their babies are already born. And uh, they kind of in a roundabout say they're not like the Egyptian women who have this life of ease and leisure. Um, So some say that these midwives told a lie. But actually what they said could be true. Uh, It's interesting. Some of the women today on the islands of Indonesia and areas of Asia, um, where these ladies do much of the farming and much of the work outside and even inside the home, um, even to this day, uh, in the morning they will have a baby, and by evening they have this baby uh, carrier and it's strapped on their back, and and they're back out in the field working. Um, Remarkable, Uh, but, but not unheard of, and so it's very very possible that that's what's taking place here, that these women did have their baby and go back to work. Um, And so it's very possible what they're saying is not a lie. So whether it's a lie or not, I don't know. There's a debate among theologians on that. Um, I think if the midwives did deceive Pharaoh, uh, we do see that that is not what God blessed. God blessed them of their fear and reverence for him. Um, And we see that He blessed, as it says, their godly bravery in obeying God before man. You see, these two midwives knew that they were to protect the innocent life of the children, that they were to value God's law above Pharaoh's law. They were to refuse to commit this act of emphasize, uh, uh, the murder of these infants and these children. And so we see that God is not excusing lying if it did take place. Um, And maybe in the situation would have been better if they did not to say anything at all. Um, But we do see that these these midwives knew to submit fully to God to not take a life. Now, at this point, you can remember earlier in the book of Genesis uh, in chapter 4, where Cain and Abel are bringing their sacrifices before the Lord. And, And Abel brings a more excellent sacrifice. And Cain is really angered by this. And he takes his brother out in the field like they're going to go for a walk and have a talk, a conversation together. And we see that Cain kills his brother, Abel. And uh, we see that God begins to talk to him. And he says, where is Abel, your brother? And Cain replies, I do not know. Am I my brother's helper? Am I my brother's keeper? The answer to that question is yes, you actually are. We're called to care for one another. We're not called to murder one another. And God says, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the soil. From that point on, the rest of uh, life, everyone knew it was not okay to take a life. It was not okay to murder someone. And, And we know that these midwives knew exactly what had happened. And they were not going to trespass God's law. They weren't going to take the life of these children uh, and murder them. Uh, They knew that God's law was a higher law. Yes, it's true. Romans 13 tells us that generally we're called to obey the government, to honor civic rulers. However, we're never called to put government in the place of God. There's a separate jurisdiction of the family separate jurisdiction of the church, and there's a separate jurisdiction of the government. And here we see the government is trying to take the place of God. Therefore, if the government tells us to do something against God's will, we're to obey God first and foremost. Now, some people might see that as being a rebel or uh, disobedience to the government. It's actually not. Maybe in a sense, that that's the way they're going to view it. It's actually an obedience to the Lord Jesus Christ. You remember when we studied through uh, the book of Daniel, uh, Daniel was commanded not to pray. And Daniel knew it wasn't right to pray because the king had made this law, but he also knew God's law is a higher law. And I'm going to go into my house and I'm going to pray. And I'm going to leave the consequences up to the Lord. And so there is a time and a place, and most of the time, we are to submit to those in government authority. 
But there are times where they tell us to do something that goes against God's word, and we're going to have to follow God's word. You recall that in the New Testament, um, in Acts chapter 5, uh, Peter and the other apostles, they actually say, we must obey God rather than any human authority. And so we, we need not obey man's laws when they contradict God's laws. We see that there's a lot of this going on in the world today, uh, that mankind is trying to redefine gender. When God has told us clearly there's two genders in the book of Genesis. Uh, even the animals have this figured out. So <laughs> why haven't humans figured it out? There's two genders. We see there's confusion over marriage today. Again, we get that from God's word. What is marriage, right? Um, and so there's all these different things that we find in our society today that are they're very confused about, but God's word has the answer. It's clearly spelled out in God's word for us. So when the government says, hey, you can't have a certain amount of people over to your house, what are we going to do? Well, we're going to have to listen to the Lord. What does the Lord tell us to do? We want to be respectful to those in authority, but at the same time, our allegiance is to the Lord first and foremost. And I'll leave that kind of conversation kind of there because we'll actually deal with that more next week when we get into chapter 2 and we'll see Moses' parents kind of face this dilemma. Um, so kind of give you a little cliffhanger there. But it does remind me um, of the early Christians uh, during the Roman time. Um, there were a lot of uh, Roman families that would have children, and unfortunately, they didn't want their children anymore. And they would take these babies to the outskirts of their town, and they would put them on the rocks or on the, the walls of the city and just leave these babies for dead. And the Christians would go out there, and they'd scoop up these babies, they'd take them home, they'd adopt them, and raise them as their own. Um, and, and they begin to love these children and share about them how God adopts us into his family. And I think it's a beautiful picture of what we can do today. Um, we see that our world today is very confused about life and the protection of life. And I believe that God's standards are higher than man's standards, that all human life begins in the womb, and that every human being is created in the image of God. Life should be respected and protected both before birth and after birth. And, uh, and so the early Christians understood this. I hope the church today understands this, that life is precious. In fact, um, it's very interesting when you are around someone who has a baby, you'll often hear the doctors and nurses use this term miracle. You know why? It's because we can't do it on our own. It's, it's God's miracle. Every life is a miracle. Every life is precious. So we see the ruler, Pharaoh, saw his first order was ignored, and it failed. So he gave this general order to, to oppress the children even more, and, and that didn't work. And then he wants these um, two midwives to get involved and, and to kill the male babies, and that didn't work out. And now he gives this order, just take the male babies, and he says, cast them into the river. Save the, the, the girl babies, though. Maybe they could be used as servants or as slaves. It's interesting that we see uh, this repeated in the New Testament. At the time of the birth of Jesus, King Herod, when he heard that there was going to be a king, became furious. He became uh, really a lunatic. And he became obsessed with uh, not wanting anyone to, to rival his, his uh, throne. And so he ordered all the male children to be killed. Uh, in fact, this is why Jesus um, was uh, called out of Egypt. In Matthew chapter 2, Joseph was told to take his family and flee to Egypt until the death of Herod. And this was to fulfill prophecy spoken by the prophet Hosea. It says, out of Egypt I called my son. Again, we see a lot of similarities to the Old Testament and the New Testament. We'll see Moses is called out of Egypt and spend some time uh, in the back of the desert uh, tending sheep and then ends up going back. We see Jesus, um, uh, his family left uh, Israel and went to Egypt for a time until the death of King Herod and then they went back. Um, so very interesting, a lot of correlation we see between the old and the new. Um, it reminds me that God values life, and, and I just close with a couple of thoughts. 
as, as a parent or even grandparents, I believe that the enemy wants to take out our children and grandchildren. And we see so much more corruption and garbage on TV and, and just weird, perverse things in the world today. And we have to be on guard. We need to be on guard for the sake of our children and grandchildren. Um, the enemy plays for keeps. And he comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But God came to give us life and life to the fullest. Life abundant. Life with him. Life knowing that he has a meaning and a purpose for us. And I believe that we need to start teaching our little ones the truth. Even when they're young as babies. There's nothing sweeter than hearing uh, the lips of a little one praise the Lord. To know scripture. Uh, to sing part of a song to the Lord. It's beautiful and it's wonderful and, and we need to make sure that we're teaching them that. I don't know if this is one of the many reasons why I'm a supporter of adoption, a supporter of foster care, a supporter of homeschooling, family devotions, family discipleship. I think there's a lot there um, that we need to be thinking about at home. How can we make sure at home we're investing in our kids and even our grandkids? So in closing, one last question. Uh, before we pray and partake in communion together. Who do you fear? We see that the Bible tells us the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It also tells us in the book of Proverbs that the fear of man brings a snare, or you could say defeat. And so we want to make sure that we have the correct biblical fear, reverence and awe and respect for God first and foremost. Because we're told that being fearful of rulers and the threats of death leads to destruction. We want to be like these midwives who feared God even more. And we see the Lord is the one who's provided us with eternal life through Jesus Christ our Savior. So my hope and prayer is that we have the courage of these midwives to do the same thing, to honor the Lord first and foremost, to trust that he's in control and that what his law says, what he says, his word is what we're going to take, uh, that his law and his words are higher than any man's law or man's word. So let's keep our eyes on the Lord and, and trust in his word. Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the truth of your word. We ask Jesus that you would continue to um, minister into our hearts as we study through the book of Exodus, uh, that we continue to look to you and trust, Lord, that you have a plan and a purpose for our life. We know, Lord, that you have good things prepared for us in advance. We ask that you'd help us to, to walk in those good things. Help us, Lord, to continue to have a spirit of thanksgiving, to be joyous with gratitude for all that you've done for us. And to know, Lord, when we enter a trial, that we'll come out stronger on the other side. To know that we're going to be strengthened as we draw close to you in those times of affliction. May our faith grow greater, deeper, and stronger. May we be drawn closer to you, Jesus, in those times. God, I ask that you be with those in our fellowship and our community who are facing a trial. That you'd walk with them in this time that they would learn to lean on you and find their comfort and hope in you. And God, we do pray this morning, if there be anyone here among us or watching online who have yet to surrender their life to you, they don't know you as their Savior and their Lord, their Redeemer, their Deliverer, that God, you would show them and reveal that truth to them today. And if that's you and say, Pastor Tim, pray for me, pray with me, I need to get right, right with God. I need to surrender my life to him. If that's you, I just want to lead you in a prayer in just a moment as every Christian is praying, every head is bowed. If that's you, I just simply want to encourage you to, to pray along with me and, and mean this in your heart as you talk to God. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I realize that my sin separates me from you. And God, I realize that you love me that you sent your son Jesus to die on the cross for my sins. That he shed his lifeblood for me. That he was buried and rose from the grave. God, I ask that you come into my heart and my life. Forgive me of all my sins. 
Be my Savior, my Lord, and my friend. Help me to follow you from this day forward. I thank you for loving me. I thank you for forgiving me. I pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You've been listening to a message from Calvary Chapel in Fergus Falls, Minnesota. With Pastor Tim Olzer. Enjoy this message? Please help us change lives by giving at ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Again, our website is ccfergusfalls.com and you can give at ccfergusfalls.com slash giving. Thank you. And may God bless you as you continue to study His Word with us verse by verse, chapter by chapter, and book by book.